yesterday we, we began to paint a picture, I believe, that we began to paint a picture of the human Jesus, of the humanity of Jesus. I mean to say the humanity of Jesus, a picture of Jesus in virtue of his humanity. And we began to do that because the Bible says very clearly that we all beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. That's the image of the Lord whose glory we behold. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And we had established that the Jesus that you see is the Jesus that you can become. We've seen from quite a number of passages the strong cor correlation, the strong connection between your vision and your transformation. That even with regards to our transformation from uh, having mortal bodies to immortal bodies, even all the way to that kind of uh, significant uh, transformation, the vision of Jesus that we see is what will facilitate that transformation. That as we look at Jesus, the Bible says we are going to become like him because we will see him even as he is. And in that passage, I was saying to us that who we are, according to the passage, is guaranteed. Who are we? We are, the, we are the sons of God. What are we? That is yet to happen. So who we are already exists in the present, but what we shall be is uh, put in onto a later date in the future. But when that day is going to break, how do we become what we should become? The Bible says that it is we, as we, the Bible says that um, um, but, when, but we know that when, we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him even as he is. So our becoming like him is because we will see him even as he is. That's First John chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But the Bible says that, however... Beloved, now with the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm trying to call your attention to that last bit. It says we shall become like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How we become like him is because we see him as he is. Amen. We shall become like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. So our change to becoming like him is because we see him as he is. And I'm simply trying to say to you that this is a principle that cuts, that is effective across board. Across board. So whether you're looking at it now in the moral sense, in the transformational sense of uh, character and uh, Christ-likeness, it is as we see him, as we see him, all right? As we see him, we shall see him as he is, and therefore we shall be like him. So the sight is very powerful here. The sight is very powerful. What you see is going to be very, very influential in how you turn out. And we said that in our transformation to becoming like Christ, all right, that reference, the image that is said before us, there are two levels of glory at the meta narrative, at the big picture level, two levels from glory to glory. And I said those two levels, uh, the first low glory that is found there has subdivisions. In that first glory, you can go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. The second glory is the glory that you enter into when you graduate or transition from the first glory that is captured in the passage. So that if you are going to become anything 
in virtue of that second glory that is mentioned, is going to be tied to what you have been able to actualize by the mercies of God and on account of your obedience and compliance to the processes of God within the first kind of glory or the first category of glory. And I said to us that that first category of glory is where the bulk of my attention and my, uh, my focus is going to be for the reason that I have just stated. Because if you do well in that first dimension of glory, then it will uh, naturally translate into what you can become in that regard in the second dimension of glory. So, when Jesus came into the world, Jesus Christ lived as a human being. And in virtue of his humanity, there was a glory that Jesus Christ showcased. That glory that Jesus Christ hosted in virtue of his humanity is the glory that God calls us and invites us to behold. And I said to us yesterday, therefore, that it's important that we see Jesus and by the mercies of God that we see him clearly, that we see him accurately. And the Bible says to us in the book of Hebrews that in chapter 2, that we see Jesus. We see Jesus. And that the backdrop is that man is supposed to be the creature that God has put in charge and God has crowned with glory and honor and has put over all the works of his hands. And then the Bible says, however, that we nevertheless do not yet see all things put on that subject in subjection to the man. We don't see all things put in subjection to the man, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus. And we see Jesus already crowned, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. That by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So, what we see, according to this uh, verse of scripture, is Jesus. And we see Jesus that was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. This is saying Jesus Christ that was incarnate. We see the incarnate Jesus. We see the incarnate Jesus. The incarnate Jesus is the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's what incarnation means. Incarnation is the putting on of flesh. Is the taking upon you, flesh. And in this case, we are talking about Jesus. So you remember that in the New Testament particularly, the Bible talks about not being carnal. And we talk about carnal Christians. That word to be carnal is to be fleshly. All right? It's to be fleshly. That's the word for carnality. So when we talk about the incarnation, we are talking about the the, the, the arrival in flesh, in, in flesh, the, 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 the carnation there is, is from the word, is the same word from which we have the word carnality, which is basically someone that is driven and led by the impulses of the human nature. So it's flesh, literally. So when the Bible says that, uh, we see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. Is calling our attention to a dimension, a department, to a certain genre or a certain category of the manifestation of Jesus. And in this context, we are looking at Jesus that was made a little lower than the angels. So this means we are looking at the man, Christ Jesus. Are you with me? Otherwise, this same Jesus, in virtue of his divinity, is the one that made the angels. He's the one that made these angels. The only way Jesus is made a little lower than the angels is so that he will be able to participate in death. And the only way that could have happened was as he took upon him the form of a human being. So he took upon him a human nature. And the Bible says it is this Jesus that has taken upon himself the human nature that we see. But we see Jesus. So the question is, do you see Jesus? And if you see Jesus, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? If you wanted to look at the human Jesus, what would emerge? Because remember that the Jesus that you see is the Jesus that you can become. So we began to study and we started to look a little bit at Jesus. Yesterday, uh, uh, we, we began to attempt to look at Jesus like if, if you 
were to look at the man Christ Jesus, what emerges? What do you see? What is going to be the fruit of that kind of contemplation? What is going to be the fruit of that kind of investigation? What is going to be the outcome of that kind of observation? What will you come out with? What will be the fruit? What will be the product of such an investigation? When the Bible says we see Jesus, the point is, what do we see as Jesus? Here, we are looking at Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Now, the reason we need to see Jesus is so that the, the, the effect that God wants to make, the impact, I mean to say, that God wants to make upon our lives can be successful. I've said it again and again, that some of the things people do that are not right, people don't do them because they don't know that they are not right. People, people do them not, I mean to say, people do them not because they do not know that those things are not right. People do them sometimes because they just cannot do otherwise. There's a power that is stronger than the will of a man that has taken a hold upon them so that that power now compels them to do exactly that which they would ordinarily not want to do. So, it is going to be more than just giving people a set of rules and regulations. Do this, don't do this. Do that, don't do that. One of the ways that God has uh, uh, provided for us to be able to receive transformation that goes deep down, that is not just lip service, and that is not just hypocrisy, that is not just acting as per se, and that will be able to receive the blessing of the Lord, and from which God will be able to receive the glory that comes, is transformation that happens to us on account of our fixation upon the person of Christ. And because Jesus Christ was a human being that walked the earth, much like God calls you and I to walk the earth, Jesus Christ now provides us the template. Huh? He provides us what? The template. And I, I, I think I said it was yesterday, I don't remember, but I, I would normally say that Jesus Christ is the template. He is the template for the manufacture of the man of God. So in that context, I normally call him the God-man. It's not original to me, please. The God-man. We call him the God-man because he is truly God and truly man. He's not half God and half man. He's truly God and truly man. Some people would say he is fully God and fully man. I prefer to say truly. He is truly God and truly man. So we call him the God-man. And I'm saying that the God-man is the standard, the yardstick for the manufacture. All right? Of the man of God. If God wanted to make his man, what is the frame of reference? What is the mode, if you like, that is going to be used in order to make the man? And that standard, that yardstick is the God man. And the God man is Christ Jesus. This is why we need to paint a picture of Jesus before our eyes. Because Jesus is the standard by which God will judge every one of us as human persons. When, when Jesus Christ says to you, I understand what you are going through, you cannot say, how do you, you can't understand. No, Jesus understands. So when we sing this song, Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. And he does not just know because he is all-knowing. All right? It, this knowledge is not in virtue of his omniscience. No. This knowledge is in virtue of the fact that he knows exactly what it is to be a human person. And I don't want to, to follow that trail because I'm sure you, you know the kind of thing I want to teach in that regard. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was tempted in every point such as we are. The only difference is that in his own case, he was without sin. And in our own case, many times we sin. But the commonality is he was tempted in every point such as we are. The Bible says, and yet without sin. It is on the basis of this that the Bible says he is able to succor them that go through any kind of 
temptation because he himself knows what it is. So the Bible says, therefore, that we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. I don't want to go into this thing. Hebrews chapter 4. The word feeling, it's powerful. We don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, but we have one, all right? Yes, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's the last bit. The last bit is the major difference. Our experiences... There's a, there, is, there is a commonality in experience. And the, the, the language of scripture here is so carefully chosen. It is that Jesus Christ, the high priest, all right, was tempted in all points, all points, like as we are. So there are, what this means is that there are points of temptation. There are points of temptation. There are nodes of temptation. There are, entry, there are entries with regards to temptation. It, it means that every temptation that you are going to face is going to be on a certain point. Hello? Uh, by that point, I'm talking about a channel. There's always an entry point. There's an entry, there's an aperture by which you are invited into sin via temptation. That aperture is the point. It's like a point of entry. And the Bible says Jesus Christ was tempted in how many of the points? All points. All points. So if you are saying, hey Jesus, uh, how can you say I'm dealing with Whatever addiction. Maybe I'm dealing with phone addiction. I cannot do it without my phone. Or I'm dealing with, you know, I don't know, internet addiction. Or I'm dealing with Facebook addiction. But there was no Facebook when you walked the earth. So how can you say you understand? Are you getting my point? The point is that the temptation to Facebook that you face, or to Instagram, or to TikTok, all right? Or whatever else is there, okay? Or, or to Twitter. The, the temptation to social media that you face, it, that temptation comes to you through a point. It comes to you through a point. You are sucked into it through a point. And with regards to that point, Jesus is not unaccustomed. Jesus is aware. He is accustomed to that point of temptation. Are you with me? Are you there? So, there are those entries, those, those points, those nodes of temptation. And the Bible says Jesus has been tempted in all points. The summary or the outcome in his own case is he came out without sin. And when you read scriptures, you actually realize that the points of temptation, how many are they? Talk to me. You should have heard this teaching before. How many are they? Three. There are three points of temptation. All the temptations you will face in life, they are categorized. The, your, the, the sucking point, the suction point will be one of three nodes. There are three nodes. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The Bible says, love not the world. First John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. All that is in the world. Then they gave us the list of all that is in the world. <laughs> what are they? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. So all that is in this world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's all that is in the world. So with regards to Jesus, that was made a little lower than the angels, he knows what it is to be tempted along the lines of the loss of the flesh, he knows what it is to be tempted 
through the lines of what? The lust of the eyes. And he knows what it is to be tempted by the pride, via the pride of life. This is part of why he's our own merciful high priest. When the first Adam, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will notice this distinction or this comparison and contrasting that the Bible kept making between the first Adam and the last Adam. The first man and the second man. He's called the second man, but the last Adam. And it is that, okay, you remember that when our first parents, our first parents, Adam and Eve, all right? When they executed that, our conspiracy against God that all of us agreed upon. When, when they executed it, you know how it was possible for Satan? What, you know what Satan did to them? In, in Genesis chapter 3, right? In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says from about the fifth verse, I don't know if I'm quoting the right thing. All right, so Satan is talking to him. God knows that in the day that you eat of this forbidden tree, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's go on. Now, this is the verse that I'm looking for. What verse is that? Is that verse 6? All right, verse 6. The Bible says, and when the woman saw, what did she see? She saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes, lost of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took up the fruit thereof. It wasn't more than that. Huh? She took up the fruit thereof and did it and gave also to her husband with her, and he did it. So when, they, when the serpent tempted them to fall, when the serpent tempted them, <laughs> this was such a terrible knockout. Huh? This was such a terrible knockout because this woman totalized everything into that one fruit. Loss of the flesh. She pinned it into it. Loss of the eyes. She pinned it into it. The pride of life. She pinned it. It was not even just, it was not a one-way temptation. And this is as terrible as it gets. Because sometimes, there are some times that the, the main aperture by which Satan is trying to suck you in is just the loss of the flesh. Hello? Just the loss of the flesh. The pride of, of the eye, the loss of the eyes, mm, not so much. The pride of life, no, not so much. So sometimes it's just flesh. It's just the flesh. Just your carnal appetite. You have heard of those kinds of men that they say the man cannot see any, anything he sees in skirt. In this case, however, in this case, however, so you know there are certain things that some people do. And they are like, I'm not, it's not as if I'm proud of what I'm doing. But somehow, all right? I'm not proud of it. This one, the loss of the flesh, 100%. They say, we'll get it here, we'll satisfy here. The loss of the eyes, 100%. The pride of life. There was nothing on account of which these people could have been held back. They had seen the entirety of their lives. They now, rea- they now believe that this tree is the, I don't know what they call it in Hausa language. You know, what, what, what your Bible is called, Bobo Nishé. What's the meaning of Bobo Nishé? Huh? Huh? Talk to me. Is that drug that they used to say cures everything? Ekpai Jebu. Have you seen when they are advertising the thing before? Hey, they, they, used to, they used to advertise it in those days. Is Volkswagen, is it Volkswagen? Yes. It's a panel van, all right, that they used to use. And 
when they bring that bottle and they hold it and they start calling the names of sicknesses, this bottle, typhoid, malaria, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, syphilis, uh, staphylococcus, orus, they, they, every sickness that they can remember, they will mention it. And they will tell you that this bottle, this one bottle like this, the content in it, it will cure everything. HIV AIDS. The something papilloma. Nothing that they will call every, everything. Arthritis. Goiter. That was what Satan did to them. Satan made our first parent believed that that tree, the particular one God said they shouldn't eat from, that that was the bobo nisha of their life. This is what will satisfy your hunger. This is what will meet your aesthetic desire. This is... So, they fell for it on all points. When the same Satan, when the same Satan Meanwhile, no, before, you, before, before this, in chapter 2, because I need you to realize that what Satan is trying to do here is a counterfeit. That point is very, is very important before I transition to Jesus. Now, in chapter 2, verse 8, remember that in chapter 2, verse 7, and the Lord God made man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And then verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 9 is where I'm going. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. That is what? Pleasant to the sight. And every tree that is good for what? For food. And the tree of life also in the middle, in the midst of the garden. So the fourth tree, type of tree that was mentioned there was supposed to be the control. You know when you do an experiment, there's a control. Hello? You are giving up on me again this evening. There's a control. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there are, three, there are four kinds of trees that are mentioned here, but not four trees. I need you to get that and get it right. Huh? There are four kinds of trees, but not four trees. You know what I mean? There are four kinds. So there's one kind of tree. And there could be 1,000 trees that fall into that category. Huh? Uh -huh. When we're trying to do landscaping for this place, for instance, we wanted to have some kind of carpet grass. And then they said the one that we grow the fastest is Port Harcourt grass. All right? That, in fact, in two weeks, it will make a good showing of itself. So they call it Port Harcourt grass. If you go out now, if you see, you will just say it's carpet grass. But that species of carpet grass is called potacot grass. Are you with me? It's one class of grass that is supposed to do one kind of thing. So there were four classes of trees here. And two of those classes of trees, there were multiplicity of trees in those classes. Then the other two were singularities. Are you there? What do I mean by that? And the Lord God, okay, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. How many trees are those? I want you to notice that word every, every. It is every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Not that the Lord God uh, made to grow the tree that is pleasant to the sight. Are you seeing my point? So, we don't know how many trees are in that category. In God's, in God's desire to meet the aesthetic needs of the man, he didn't just give him a tree. 
He, he made to grow every tree that would be pleasant to the sight. Every tree. By this, okay, I have a little time. By this, God was trying to establish for us, I need you to realize that God was legitimizing your aesthetic, your aesthetic uh, 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 desires, your aesthetic faculty. What I mean by that is the, the aspect of your being that used to like beautiful things. I'm saying to you that that faculty is not wrong, it's not bad, it's not evil. God made you with aesthetic possibilities. With est you have an aesthetic palette. You know your taste board? You have a taste board for aesthetics. God made us so. But there are trees, according to God, that are pleasant to the sight. So that it's just that it's not just one tree. There are trees. So there are different ways to be beautiful. Are you with me? There are different ways to be beautiful, but there is a guardrail. By, by saying there's a guardrail, I'm trying to say that it does not therefore mean that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. No, it's not. There is something that is intrinsically beautiful, and there are things that are intrinsically ugly. And I'm trying to say to you that that definition comes from God. When God told Moses to make robes, for Aaron and for his sons. Why did he say they should make them? For beauty and for glory. For beauty and for glory. There is something that God calls beauty. And while there could be many trees that God will consider as beautiful, every tree is not beautiful. That's what it means. And as Christians, even though we live in a broken world, part of the problem or, or, or the, the import of living in a broken world is that our proclivities, there's a corruption that has taken place in man when man fell so that his natural, what now appears, the thing we call the natural man now is the unnatural man by original design. Do you get the point? The natural man is not the natural man. What would have been called the natural man is different from what we now call the natural man. What we call the natural man now is the broken, corrupt man that is a product of the fall. This is a man that virus has entered into his operating system. You know, when, when your laptop takes on a virus and begins to malfunction, that is what sin is. So you cannot completely independently trust everything that comes out of that system. I don't know if you've had the kind of laptop that sometimes something goes wrong and then when you press the key huh, on your keypad that has A written on it, when you press it, you will see three will show up on your screen. Have you had that kind of problem before? You press A. So people that now know this, the thing, they say, oh, no, if you are looking for A, press that Q key. Q. <laughs> if you want to type A, press Q. Q key. So what if I want Q? They say you have to go to number two. You want to ask two. Press it. So, how do I get to press Q? No, press A. You get. It, the system is malfunctioning. Are you with me? That was what happened to human beings. After the fall of Adam, you cannot completely trust what you now call your natural instincts anymore. So it doesn't make, it's not, it's not a very reasonable thing to say, well, me, I like to just wear anything that makes me comfortable. You need to check with God. Because the last time I checked, after man fell, man was broken. Corruption entered into the operating system of the human person. So you, you cannot just say, I like it. Well, it's fine to me. There's something that God defines as beautiful. And God 
ensure that trees, trees, every tree that is what? Pleasant to the sight. Out of the ground, made the Lord to God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So these are many trees here. And good for food. That's also many trees. Are you following me? Because the every is huh? qualifies the trees that are good to behold, pleasant to the sight, and qualifies the one that is good for food. Then there's a, semi, there's a semicolon. Then they now say, the tree. Do you get it now? This one now is a singularity. There's the tree, the tree of life. Also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you have said what I'm saying, say amen. amen. Online, I hope you are following me. <laughs> it's not, we have not started the study, so you should be following. The tree that is pleasant to the sight is not a tree. There are trees in that category. The tree that is good for food is not just a tree. There are different trees. I'm not just saying that you have 100 mango trees. I'm saying you have mango, you have orange, you have apple, you have vine. Are you, get, are you there? So there are plenty trees that are supposed to serve the same purpose. You know why I did all of this? Let me tell you why I did all of this. Because this was God's provision. Are you there? This was God's provision. The first three trees were God's provision for the man. And then the fourth one was a control. That control was just put there in order that man will be able to exercise his volition. You see, the, you cannot say you obey somebody if you cannot disobey them. My phone, my phone does not have any virtuous moral, does not have moral virtue. When I dial a number and then I make a call, I don't say, I don't say oh wow, thank you so much, oh. thank you so much. Ah, thank you so much. Because it's not a virtuous act. There's no moral virtue. The reason is because this thing is a robot in a manner of speaking. But if I called somebody, if I called somebody that is schooling in the University of Joss and you are in Bauti Road, and I say, please, I need to get an information across to somebody in permanent sight. Please help me. And unknown to me, you are even broke. And you don't have transport fare. But because of how much respect you have for me, you now put yourself on the road and walked the distance from Battery Road Campus to permanent site, delivered the message, then you came back to Battery Road. When I hear of what, when you now give me the feedback that I have delivered the message, you know it is only appropriate for me to say thank you. Because if you had chosen, you wouldn't have gone. You could have chosen to not go. Are you there? God wanted man to perpetually be in a love relationship with him. You cannot say you love somebody if you cannot not love them. So that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there to be the constant proof that the only reason man is with God is because man wants to be with God. It's not because he doesn't have a choice. Are you there? So that fourth tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is the control. It's the control. So stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. When, when Jesus did all of this, when the Lord God, that Lord God is actually, if you drill deep, you realize it is Jesus. Hello? Hello? Hmm. In, in Genesis chapter 1, it is God and God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In fact, when you get to verse 26, and God said, let us make man. Are you with me? In Genesis chapter 1, the designation of the main actor 
is God. In Genesis chapter 2, it is the Lord God. Hello? The Lord God. The designation is not for nothing. I just wanted to clarify because I said Jesus. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God, the Lord God, and the Lord God, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Of course, it was appropriate. It's not surprising that it is the Lord God that formed man because that is the same one that will be incarnate in the end. Huh? The, the one that will eventually bring God to men. So the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Verse 7, verse 8, and the Lord God. Are you seeing it? It is the Lord God. Verse 9, and out of the ground made the Lord God. So the Lord God made to grow out of the ground every tree that is pleasant to the sight. The, the point for bringing you here is this. Number one, God had an elaborate arrangement to meet the legitimate need of his human creatures, of humanity. There was a plurality of trees that God put there to meet our basic need for food, to attend to our flesh, to attend to our body. There were a plurality of trees. Imagine that God just said some trees should grow. And when they say, ah, sir, to what intent are these ones growing? He said, I just want to satisfy the aesthetic appetite of my people that these trees that God made them to grow, the only reason why God made them to grow is so that you will find something beautiful to look at. Are you there? There are, there are utilities that they are good, they are pleasant to the sight. Pleasant to the sight. So I need you to know, for those of you that think that uh, the way to be spiritual is to be shabby, you are out of order. Are you there? Are you there? Hello? Uh -huh. There is nothing more. Holiness and godliness is not in shabbiness. Right? And so it's not when you wear a green suit and a yellow sandal, then we can now know that this world is not your home. No. No. God recognizes Hello? <laughs> God recognizes that you have an aesthetic appetite, an aesthetic faculty. And in the original beginning, the God that gave you that appetite, he went outside and provided for what will meet the appetite that he already gave to you. Are you there? You can almost say that the God that created the problem also created the solution for it. So, don't just tell me, so what should I do? What should I do? No. There is something that God has provided. There is a way that God has ordered that we should satisfy our legitimate cravings. And the trees that God ordered for the satisfaction of the aesthetic uh, 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 desires and needs of human beings, they were plural. There were many trees. What, what will I eat? Food for the body, food for the flesh. There were also many trees. And then God now decided to put something in the midst of that garden that is called the tree of life. The tree of life. And I'm not teaching this thing today, so I, can't, I don't want to get into all of that. Now, that tree of life was one tree that is called the tree of life. Imagine that when Satan came, when Satan came to the woman and to the man, Satan gave them one thing, one tree that has one fruit and suddenly told the man and the woman, obviously, that 
everything that God has made available in these plenty, 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 plenty trees, all of what you are supposed to get from all of those trees, they are actually in this one fruit. Do you understand? When they saw this tree, the tree that God said they shouldn't eat from, the Bible said, the woman saw that it was good for food. Hmm? And that it was pleasant to the sight, to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. One tree. Even Almighty God needed to actualize plenty trees in order to provide for the satisfaction of this appetite. Now Satan has come and is saying to you that all the many things that God has provided for you, they are nothing unless you are able to get this one thing that they say you should not touch. And in fact, it is only this one thing they say you should not touch that we really, really, really satisfy all your needs. Everybody gets to that juncture in life. You know, where all the many things that you have don't look that important. And then it looks as if the only thing that will solve all your problems in this life is that one thing that you don't have. At a point in your life, you know, a lot of young people are here. At a point in your life, it would have been, if only I can gain admission. It, it looks as if, if you can gain admission to the university, you will have no problem anymore in this world. Did anybody have that experience? Like, if only, if only, I call it the plague of if only. There's the plague. Any time that you are tempted to totalize your satisfaction into one thing, an enemy is at work. I don't care what it is. Any time that Satan is gotten you to the point where you start to totalize your fulfillment and you totalize your, your destiny, you totalize your purpose into one thing outside of God that is not God himself, I'm saying that an enemy is at work. After you gained admission, you realize that the rat race didn't end. Satan just simply shifted the goalpost. For some persons, is if only I can make a two-one. Some persons, if only I can make a first class. For some other persons, is if only I can graduate. And it now looks as if there is no problem in this world other than graduation. Huh? A point comes in your life that you now look as if when you collect the certificate, you will look at it. You, you, will not, you will not understand what it was that was making you feel like this is... I think it was... Uh, I can't remember. But somebody... And I can't even... But the person said that one of the most tragic moments in a man's life is when he has finally, finally, laid, been able to lay hold on that which he thinks will deliver the most to him. And then the thing has let him down. So now you have the certificate and it doesn't look like a lot anymore. Like, what am I going to do with a BSc? I'm 27. I'm not even in a relationship. Let alone. Married. All my other friends, the sisters, all of us were in fellowship that time. The ones that, did, that never went to the universities, they are now married. Of what use is this certificate when I don't have a husband? It will not look as if, in fact, if, if care is not taken, you may be as rash as to tell God that God, I don't need any other thing in this. If you can just give me a husband, 
You know, there's a way you, you feel it in your mind. It's just that you know too much to say it. So you don't say it. But somewhere inside your heart, there's a part of you that actually believes that if God can just give you a good husband, let him go on break. You'll be fine. You, you, you people will meet when you finish from the world. Like, just, just give me a good husband. Then maybe after a while, you get a husband. Hmm? Then you find out that after three children, that's if God helped you having children. After three children, they are all boys. <laughs> See, so in this my own life now, I will not know what it is, what it means to cuddle a daughter. You, people actually go from miracle service to miracle service asking man of God to pray so that at least their fifth child can be a girl. And it looks like God has not done anything for them in this life because they don't have a daughter. Can I tell you something? Satan will ensure that you never come out of that cycle if you allow him. When you strike one, he will replace you with another. When you, when you are, he will replace you with another. You, if you allow Satan, you will be desperate until you die. He said that we, there will always be something. There are some people now that the problem they are having with their husband is that they are still paying house rent. All your colleagues at work. Even the people that are your juniors at work, they have moved into their own house. The woman wakes up in the morning, you will think that she was pursued in a dream of the night. Why is her countenance down? See, every day that I wake up and I look at this house, she has forgotten that there are women her age that are under the bridge at Oshodi. And I'm saying, if you let Satan you will die a desperate person. You, and I mean it in a negative way. You will never know rest. You will never know peace. There will always be something that Satan will dangle before you and say, everything you have is nothing. If only you can have this one. If only you can have this. This is the only thing that will satisfy all your needs in this life. Huh? It is desired for food. It is, it is pleasant to the sight and it will make you wise. So all the trees that God made to grow for food no longer mean anything. The ones that God made to grow that are pleasant to the sight no longer mean anything. Even the tree of life had not been subordinated to this one that was forbidden by God. Lift up your right hand. Say, oh God, deliver me from the tyranny of if onlys. Deliver me from the tyranny of if only. In the name of Jesus, circumcise my heart. Win my affection from every desire that is inordinate that Satan paints before my eyes as the all in all. Deliver me from the tyranny of if only in the name of Jesus. Amen. If only. Hallelujah. And it doesn't matter whether you are young or old. 
I mean, and everyone that is a parent here, you know it. it the thing is, it's part of the fully human nature now. Are you with me? I don't know, maybe like two years ago or something, we were driving someplace, and two years ago, at least, maybe like two years ago, or maybe slightly more, definitely not last year, and my children told me, they said, Dad, you don't have a cool car. I said, what? They said, you have a good car, but you don't have a cool car. Glory to God. They are not aware that I had a car before my dad had a car. Do you know the implication? <laughs> you don't know. The implication is that I was a married man before I had the car. And I had the car before my dad. So when we used to go for a holiday from the village to the other village <laughs> where my grandparents used to live, my dad had a CD-175 Honda CD bike. Yamo. It, 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 was, it was that CD175. Does anybody know CD? Uh, uh, hey, older people here, you see, exactly. There are people here that know this. They know CD175. CD175 is what we used to ride. That's what my dad used to use to take me, my mom, and when we were, there were, were two children. That's what we used to use, we used to make the journey. That journey will be about maybe 150 kilometers from the village where we were at to the village where my, where my grandparents stayed when we go for holiday. CD 175. Glory to God. They're my own children. <laughs> they, they, they say I don't have a cool car. Say so you have a good car, but you don't have a cool car. Listen to me. If you allow Satan, you will die in desperation. You, you will never be settled until you die. So when Jesus came along, when Jesus now came along, huh? when Jesus came along, and he went into... The wilderness, as led by the Holy Spirit. That passage we read yesterday. The Bible says, and he was there. You remember? According to the Lucan account of that story, he was in the wilderness. Of course, we all know he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says, and in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, so those 40 days of temptation, according to Luke, Luke chapter 4, is not that hard. Huh? Those 40 days of temptation, the Bible says when they were ended, when they were ended, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So the temptation of Jesus lasted for 40 days. He was 40 days tempted of the devil. Are you there? This is one of the mysteries. Or let's say one of the secrets. Because the, the temptations of those 40 days, we have no clue what they were. He was 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, what days? Those 40 days of temptation. In those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, what were ended? The 40 days of temptation. When they were ended, he afterward hungered. Then verse 3. And the devil said unto him, when he said, I'm saying this thing to him, when the 40 days of temptation had ended and Jesus Christ was now afterward hunger, hungry. All right? He hungered according to the KJV. Then it was then that the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. 
Jesus overcame it. Verse 4. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Verse 5. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, this is after the 40 days of temptation have ended, and Jesus Christ afterward was hungry, and Satan has tempted him to turn stone into bread, and Jesus refused. He takes him up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that it is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Okay. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Huh? What did he do? Give me verse 5 again. Verse 5. And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed him, showed unto him all the kingdoms. He showed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Was appealing to his sense of sight. Huh? The lust of the eyes. And said to him, if only you bow, everything you can see like this, I'll give it to you. And Jesus responded in verse 8. And Jesus answered and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 9. And he brought him into, he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a, on, a, on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Why? For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. <laughs> and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse 12. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is what? The pride of life. See, the kind of person you are, gravity is not applicable to you. And you need to show it off. You are the son of God. Throw yourself up from here. Angels will carry you in their hands. You will not crash. You are beyond gravity. It, it, this one works very well with men of God. A lot. Hey, a lot. The point comes when so-called men of God start to feel invincible. Huh? They start to feel like God themselves. That's how we lost many of them. Satan comes and whispers to them. Say, you are not a common person. You have uncommon grace. There are things that common believers, if they do, they will crash. But try it and see. You realize that you will not crash. That's how they succumb. They sinned. And when they came for service, later that same night, huh? and they prayed, Somebody got a healing, and they were, they were astounded. They were, they were shocked to their bone. And then, Satan will now come and whisper, did I tell you? Did I, you are not a normal person like every normal person. You know how much price you have paid? Do you know how much of the economy of the work of God in your generation depends upon you? Do you know how indispensable you are to God? You are so indispensable that God has waivers upon waivers upon waivers upon waivers for you. Because without you, the purposes of God in your generation will not be accomplished. Therefore, whatever God needs to overlook so that you can continue to help God, God will overlook it. Try it again and see. You will try it again. Huh? Then you will not see a bigger miracle. Even you, you will be shocked. This was how some of the, let's leave matter. But do you understand my point? This is the pride of life. When Satan starts to make you feel larger than life for no just cause. 
Say, throw yourself. If other people throw themselves, what will happen is a fall. If you, you throw yourself, it will be a glide. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hey. Lemo. So, and, and there are many Christians, even in their private lives, that have begun to step into those places. They have begun to touch their costing. And they are still speaking in tongues. They have begun to touch their costing. And people are still bringing testimony after they ministered and shared in fellowship. So, they are not beginning to enter into that place. That the kind of son of God that you are, all those vigils that you used to do, you think they are for nothing. The sacrifices you have made. God doesn't have many people like that. Though. So, you have entered into an economy. And you know we are very <laughs> bogus grammar. That Satan uses to patronize us. You have entered into an economy of the workings of grace through the effulgence of the glory of his majesty. That you glide, you glide. Where all that people fall, you glide. You can do the same thing that people do and they fall, but when you do it, you glide. Come on, somebody say glide. <laughs> the pride of life. I'm showing you Jesus. The man Jesus. He was tempted in all points. Like you and I. The difference is in his own case. What happened? He sinned not. He sinned not. So let me tell you a very simple thing before we pray. And that simple thing is hinged on. He sinned not. That's what I want you to take out of here tonight. All that story I've been telling you is so that I can show you the man Jesus. That the man Jesus, he sinned not. It was not because there was no opportunity for him to sin. What people don't know about this story, and I, I don't want to keep you any as long as I did yesterday. What people don't know about this story is that the treasury of this story is the fact that Jesus had just recently, less than two months ago, there's been a public attestation and affirmation of his ministry. At the Jordan rivers, the heavens parted. And the spirit of the Lord descended upon him. Bodily, like a dove. And the voice of God spoke out of the heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. If Jesus Christ had succumbed to the offer that the God of this age had made to him, because Satan was not lying. He's the God of this age. The Bible says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them whose mind the God of this age has blinded. The Bible calls him the God of this age. Satan gave dominion to darkness. Adam gave dominion to darkness when he sinned. So imagine that offer. When Satan made the offer to Jesus, nobody that was at the Jordan River was there. How many human beings were there in the wilderness? Or were there on the pinnacle of the temple? Nobody else was there. How many human beings were there on the mount? Nobody else was there. It was Jesus, Satan, and then the, all the invisible spirits that eyes cannot see. Now imagine if Jesus had bowed the knee. If he had bowed the knee and he had worshipped Satan there, and let's assume that Satan kept his own end of the bargain, gave him all those things. When that man comes back from the mount, huh? and he begins to swim in affluence, and we tell you that he is running this by a serpentine spirit, do you know what you'll be saying? You say, oh, we're there at Jordan. We heard. What you are not aware of is that transaction happened in the night. In the secret crucible of the man's retreat ground. Some people went to the mountain to go and pray. They came back with Ogbanje. 
there were people that legitimately went to go and pray. They came back, they came back with Ichekpa. You know Ichekpa? Bush baby. They have, they have the one strand of the locks. You, you know, hey, I will tell you things, but not this night. The, the strands, they came back with one strand of the locks of a bush baby. Bush babies are reputed for dreadlocks. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, I know that there's something you know as bush baby. Maybe that one people used to eat it. It's not that one I'm talking about. I'm talking of Ichekpa. Hmm? Uh -huh. I don't know the name of Ichekpa in your language, but where I come from, the way they used to call Ichekpa is bush baby. Hello? The thing has locks. In fact, in fact, there are sometimes that when you visit Ezemubaba Laos, Enchanters, diviners, part of the thing they will require from you in order to concoct a certain concoction and to come up with a portion for you will be one strand of the head of the hair of a bush baby. And hello, you know, Jesus says, Fear not, for I have overcome the world. So don't be afraid. When when you bring the hair, there is, you, you know, you need to run quality control test. So we, they run the test of genuineness. And there's a way they do You put an egg and you put the, the hair. The hair will now curl around the egg because you can go and steal somebody's Brazilian wig and weave it and bring it as a lock, as a dreadlock of an Ichepa. So there's a, there's a test that Baba will run to know what it is. When they went there, Ichepa met them and gave them a strand of his hair. And told them, make sure that there's a little, even if it's just one piece of this hair, Put it inside the left leg of the shoe you wear every time you go to preach. The last thing you saw of the man was the waters of Jordan and the God that spoke from heaven. You did not know that when he went into the wilderness, Satan came with a proposal and he fell. So, so, that, so some of your celebrity men of God, they left God a decade ago, but you are not aware. You know, I told you of the guy that used to pray who eventually ended up in Ghana to go and meet Nana to wash face. Even this last weekend I was in Abuja, I still saw his big billboard. The one they did for crossover service. This one, I know it. and I know it because he comes from my place. So, he, so you may not even know the person I'm talking about. Eh? He, he comes from my state. And I know people that were best of friends with him when he was still with Jesus. And some of the quiet secret efforts that they had tried to make in order to restore him. But it never works. Deceived the woman and married her. The woman only got into the marriage to find out what she had married. But we see Jesus. Yet without sin. If you look at Jesus long enough, you know, one of the things I have found out is that Satan is actually helpless against the word of God. <laughs> have you realized? Satan is truly, truly helpless against the word of God. And the other lessons that I've taught you before. Let me tell you something, people of God. 
If you are a believer, please note this. From the life of Jesus, note this. One of the things Satan cannot do is make you do what you don't want to do. That's the last lesson this evening. Satan cannot, from the life of Jesus, we see that Satan cannot make you do what you do not want to do if truly you are a child of God. If thou be the son of God, he said to Jesus. And I want to say to you by extension that if you also become a child of God, Satan cannot make you do what you do not want to do. Satan will not be able to do more than what he tried to do with Jesus. What is it? He will harass you. He will pummel you. Imagine tempting somebody back to back, back to back for 40 days. And when they finally rang the bell, bang! Over! You now went into extra time. Those three temptations that were recorded for us, those were the ones that happened in extra time. And they recorded those ones for us so that you will understand the point of Hebrews chapter 4 when he says that he was tempted in all points such as we are, yet he was without sin. So they tempted him. What are the points? The loss of the flesh. Turn the stones into bread. He overcame it. The loss of the eyes. See all the kingdoms of this world. See them. See, 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 see. If you worship me, I will give everything you see. I give it to you. The loss of the eyes, he overcame it. The pride of life, there's nobody like you anywhere. You are the only man of God. You are the only son of God. If you jump from, <laughs> I, I leave matter. If the, the Satan took Jesus Christ to the pinnacle, the pinnacle of the temple, the God for whom the temple is built, he lives inside the temple between the cherubim. They took Jesus and they took him above it. Like some of those very, very, very ignorant people that were wasting my time on Twitter today. Eh? The thing is a, is a combination of delusions of grandeur plus like, like gigant, an enormous an overdose of biblical illiteracy. Those people that wake up and say, because they are children of God, there's nothing they do. God never gets offended. God does not kill. How is it? How, what kind of God is that? Even, even the ones that your ancestors used to worship in the village, they used to try. Then you now say the God that gives, that gives life cannot take the life that he gives. What did you smoke? Delusions. They, they took Jesus above the temple. Meanwhile, the presence of God is domiciled in the Holy of Holies between the cherubim upon the ark somewhere under. So now where they have put Jesus is even above God. You don't understand. They have put Jesus on top. In order for Jesus to even see God, he has to look down. That, that is where some of the people that you are listening to, that is, that is the Please, that's the destination. That's where they want to take you to. And I can tell you that the day you will jump from the place, there will be no angels. There will be angles. The thing you will follow, you know angle. Don't, don't know it. And they use all kinds of high-sounding nonsense. Here are gods. He are God. Ah. One said, if God kills, it means you also you can kill. 
Because you are a son of God. Hello? Hello? Even if you are hallucinating and you combine it with constipation, you, you will still have, you, will, you should still retain more sanity and sensibility than to say that kind of thing. That because I'm a child of God, everything God can do, I should be able to do. So I asked the guy, I said, God neither sleeps nor slumbers. You, child of God, you sleep, you snore. You even fall from your bed. Why are you not like your father, God? You know his answer? He blocked me. <laughs> this afternoon, this afternoon. This, today, oh, today, this afternoon. He blocked me. He said, throw yourself down. You will not fall. You will climb. But we see Jesus. And the operational word tonight is yet without sin. I need you to believe from this place tonight that you can live without sinning. We see Jesus. And it does not matter the point, the point by which temptation comes, we see Jesus. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We see Jesus. Yet without sin. Bow your heads. Maku tesosai. Maya koska brofeski la matia kubarane. We see Jesus. And tonight I'm showing you. Yet without sin. We see Jesus. That's how we see him tonight. Yet without sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Because we see Jesus. There's a way you will see Jesus that will bring you into the experience of victory over sin. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. Every point, every point tempted in every point such as you and I. But we see Jesus. When we see Jesus, he was without sin. Bole kota sei. Bufi tesco brekade. Labasu samia tu gebarahades. I want you to talk to the Lord in the next two minutes. I don't, want, I don't know what you want to say, but I want you to talk to the Lord. 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 Not as far as I thought we would go tonight. But it was a necessary digression. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. Our high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands. He can feel with us. When we are tempted. Jesus Christ does not process our temptation from the standpoint of his divinity. He understands it as a man. We see Jesus made lower, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, now crowned with glory and honor. We see the man, Christ Jesus, and he was without sin. Mekai 
Ambrana tose saibo parati ke banda selambro kate makrikoski bra akimana tanzo se taimako milanenteski bro felinanta kobri kate abre fotaske bro feni natasu semi e maso sayade. Can you see this Jesus? This Jesus, can you see him? Because as you see him, you are becoming like him. This Jesus, of whom it was said, yet without sin, yet without sin. That you may be pressured, but yet without sin. We see Jesus. Asko feta se sako feta la boda gadu manete sosa. Breleske bro fis kabanata kruku tashka bo te salabru ke taminantos ke bo. Aresko fanatambre kalimonda selamo fati se saba. Rekene tanumuna taso sai barakwatine selamomba. Embeneti se aninante kombrikade ne solomonte da. Akreko telimanda se ileminatambro kapo. Moti te yakatambro ketusa. Aiko parati melana hande se saiba. Arabenate se imonatali mon de kebula manato se sai o te natali minanta se brokati monde se li e brana ku te na se sabale minatuba we see Jesus Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Must be honored. Must be honored. Must be honored. Jesus must be honored in my life every day. Jesus must be honored. Must be honored. Must be honored. Jesus must be honored in my life every day. Hallelujah. Jesus must be honored. Must be honored. Must be honored. Jesus must be honored in my life. One more time. Say Jesus must be honored, must be honored, must be honored. Oh yes, Jesus must be honored in my life every day. Jesus must be honored. In my life. One more time. Jesus must be honored. Every day. Oh yes. Jesus must be honored. In my life. Every day. Lord, we ask that we show us the Jesus of whom it was said, yet without sin. And that it wouldn't matter the point whether it be the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. That will have a word in season as from you every time that the enemy comes in the mighty name of Jesus. We see Jesus. We see Jesus not succumbing. We see Jesus not giving in. We see Jesus not going down. We see Jesus not yielding. We see Jesus. And as we see him, we are becoming like him. Lord, I ask, let there be a layer, a layer of immunity. A layer of immunity. Immunity against temptation that is occasioned in the spiritual structure of each of our lives on account of the picture that you painted before us tonight that would be a little stronger than we were before we came here tonight. Oh, that at every point of sin, our capacity, our strength, our stamina will be a lot more now than it was before tonight. The places where we used to go down, when we get there, we will find ourselves still standing because we see Jesus and of him it was said, yet without sin. Deliver us from the tyranny of if only. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.